Hey there, uh, Wake Angel 2001 is back for another uh, vlog. I know there haven't really been any of these over the month of December because, you know, I work at Toys R Us and December is our busiest month, but hey, Christmas is over, return day is over, and I finally have a day off where I'm not just catching up on my sleep or doing Christmas shopping. So, hooray! Of course, I am fighting off a bit of a cold which I caught from my mother, who caught it from some kid who was sitting next to her in the Star Wars movie because she didn't want to sit in the front row with the rest of us, so she had to go a row back where she sat next to some stranger who gave her a cold. <clears throat> yeah, Mom, I'm, uh, I'm still kind of on that. You have no idea how much phlegm I've coughed up. But this is a Patreon-supported vlog. It is, um... A request of Josh Henniger, my only Patreon supporter for the month of uh, November, who requested that I do a vlog about Sonic Spinball, um, <clears throat> one of the more niche titles of uh, the Sonic games on the Sega Genesis. Now, Sonic Spinball. Okay, if that jump cut seemed unnatural, it's because the phone rang and I had to go address it. So, Sonic Spinball. Um... This game is kind of well known for being made by uh, the American Sega branch, uh, Sega of America. Although Sonic 2 and 3 were also largely developed in America, this is kind of uh, this is kind of the one that everybody knows was made in America, because uh, you know it's just so radically different from the other Sonic games on the console. So I got I got some notes here. Uh, Sonic Spinball was first released in. Uh, in November of 1993, which actually puts it after the release of Sonic CD on September 23rd, but before the release of Sonic 3 on February 2nd, 1994. So that officially makes us the fourth Sonic game for the Sega Genesis. <clears throat> well, I guess, I guess it still counts as a third game on the Genesis because the Sega CD was an add-on to the console. Will you still count it as a Genesis game? Because you can't play a Sonic CD without a Genesis to attach it to. I'm going to count it as a Genesis game. Even though it's a CD peripheral, it's still a Genesis game. So, uh -huh. so what is the game like? Um, the gameplay in Sonic CD is kind of like the natural extension of the, uh, of the pinball type stages, a uh, Spring Yard Zone, and, um, uh, and, uh, C Casinopolis. That's what it was called? Casinopolis? Casino Park? Oh my god, I feel very unprepared. I'm gonna verify this so I don't sound like an idiot. After all, this is a Patreon-supported vlog. Okay, we're back. It is, a uh, Casino Night Zone. There. Now... I know that a lot of people probably already, as soon as I said Casinopolis, uh, a whole bunch of people probably went down to the comments and said, it's called Casino Night Zone. So, all you people who don't watch the video the whole way through before commenting, now you guys look like the idiots. <clears throat> okay, so, my point is that Sonic CD, Sonic Spinball, did I mention I have a, have a bit of a cold? It's kind of, it's kind of throwing me off my game here. Sonic Spinball was made to be like an entire game based off of those two stages, like, like uh, with with pinball bumpers and flippers and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and uh, well, what can I say about this game? I've never actually beaten it. Uh, I've gone as far as the last stage, although I never actually beat the last stage. Um, this is because the last stage is actually quite hard, but also, uh, well, I haven't actually seriously made an effort to beat the game since I was, like, 13. This is because, well, you know, like, the game, it's not bad, but I really don't, I can't stand a long play session. Like, it has no, no... There is a level skip code, but it's kind of complicated to put in. Um, like, on, from the menu, you have, to, you have to put in the button commands, and then when you start, it'll take you to that level. There's no, like, 
There's no putting in a simple code and then getting a menu of the stages to choose like you would in Sonic 1 or Sonic 2. So having to remember a code for each individual level is a bit of a pain. And um, it's, uh, well, the stages are kind of long. Like, um, the goal of the game is to na navigate through these pinball fortresses and hit various targets around the screen to unle unlock the paths that will take you to the Chaos Emeralds. The first two stages have three emeralds, then, there, then there's five in the rest, so there's quite a bunch of Chaos Symbols yet to collect. Um, and can you guess that this game was actually released before the lore had officially been established that there are seven Chaos Emeralds? Yeah, it's actually pretty interesting if you think how long it took for them to officially establish the lore behind Chaos Emeralds. A lot of people would think that, the, that they had this whole thing going on, like, like no, not really. <clears throat> This game has like 15 or 16 emeralds in it. Then you got like, uh, you got, you got Sonic the Fighters, which had eight Chaos Emeralds in it. Uh, um, I mean, even if the plot of Sonic 3 and Knuckles focused around there being seven emeralds, which, when reunited with their master emerald, unlocked these seven super emeralds, that all sounds like lore that also came up before Sonic the Fighters. <laughs> so, it, even with Sonic 3 and Knuckles, it wasn't until Sonic Adventure that they actually established that, yes, there are seven mythical baubles called Chaos Emeralds, and only seven of them. <clears throat> Tangent. <laughs> um... So when you collect the Chaos Emeralds, the path to the boss room is open and you take on the boss. Uh, and these levels can take a while. If you don't know where everything is, it can easily take you almost half an hour to, to do a single stage. Even if you do know, because Sonic is largely ballistic, you can steer him with the D-pad, but, but he's carrying a lot of momentum from the flippers or the bumpers, so actually maneuvering him is very difficult. Especially considering that you might not, you might not necessarily see the target that you're aiming for, so you got to shoot at it from memory, like where it was when you when you panned past it before. So even if you know where everything is, uh, I don't think it's really possible to reliably speed run this game. I uh, I played the game a little bit before doing this vlog. I spent uh, 20 minutes. I got through the first stage. And I got up to the boss of the second stage before I died, and uh, I just didn't want to go through all the crap to get back up to the boss room in the second stage again. So I'm like, okay, yeah, I remember what this game was like now. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, like, the game can be a little bit tedious. It's a, it's a bit of a time waster. It's a lot, you need a lot more time investment in this game than you would in most other Sonic games. Uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, <laughs> he said as he looked away from the camera. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that is, gameplay-wise, that is basically it. It's pretty much a pinball simulator where you get to steer around the, uh, the, so so the ball a little bit more. And it's, uh, Sonic. Uh, it's fun the funny thing is, Sonic still has, like, a walking cycle and even the spin dash move despite the fact that there's maybe 2% of the game that you actually spend walking and standing. <laughs> uh, Alright, so... I guess, I guess the only thing to do now is talk about how this tied into the cartoons at the time. Because, uh, you gotta remember, 1993. That's when both of the Sonic the Hedgehog cartoons were airing. The Adventures of Sonic cartoon had weekday mornings, and the Sat AM cartoon had Saturday mornings. So, so of course they were these these were obviously made to tie into each other. In fact, this might be the closest thing to an official adaptation of the Sonic the Hedgehog cartoons. Mostly Sat AM but also with just a tiny bit of the Adventures cartoon. I'll, I'll explain. Um, there are cameos in this game. Uh, like, a lot, like, a couple of the bad, of the enemy badnik characters that appear in this game actually are from the cartoons. Uh, let's go to some, uh, I'll, I'll show some pictures and narrate over that. Um, 
Then there's a uh, uh, um, beach. Uh, characters, like I said, characters from the cartoon make appearances in this game. And then there's Sonic's appearance, too. Uh, his appearance is actually tied into how he looked in those cartoons as well. Uh, not Dr. Eggman's. Look. Look at Dr. Robotnik. L look again. Yeah. There we go. You see that? That is, uh, he has black sclera, like the whites of his eyes are black. Like, like they were in the cartoons. But aside from that, that's very much the video game appearance of him. He has a big round body. He has a, <clears throat> he has a spherical head. Perfectly bald. Like, <clears throat> it's cold, man. Like, that is the, that is the video game Robotnik, just with blacked out eyes. Okay, so I guess it's, um, I guess I'm gonna have to start talking over some, some pictures so that you have context of, of what I'm going to be getting at for the next little while. So, just to reiterate, um, here's the box art for the Sega Genesis version of the game, uh, released in America, of course. Uh, you see that Dr. Robotnik there, despite the, black, the blacked out sclera, it's very much um, the video game Dr. Robotnik. The perfectly round body, the, the shape of his face and nose, the, the eggmobile, that's all Dr. Robotnik. <clears throat> the Game Gear art actually used um, the more cartoon version of Robotnik, but the cartoon version from the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon. And um, can't help but think that this is the wrong Robotnik to go with. I mean, he's a little goofier and sillier looking, and I kind of would have liked to see the Sad AM version of Robotnik on the cover of a video game, because that guy looks so intense and awesome. Of course, um... That isn't the only instance of an adventurous character making a cameo in this game. Uh, Scratch actually does appear in one of the bonus stages, but that's really it. Almost every other cameo is from the Sad AM cartoon, such as Cluck, Dr. Robotnik's pet chicken, uh, pet robot chicken that is, and um, and the Freedom Fighter cast. Uh, of course, Tails is, uh, is in it. Um, he's actually the only one that appears outside the special stages. If um, if you watch the opening cutscene in the game, he's flying Sonic in a plane, and the plane gets shot down, and Sonic jumps off. Um, and that's where the game starts, with him coming up in the sewers at the base of the mountain. Um, but yeah, Tails isn't the only one that makes a cameo. Yeah, we actually get cameos of three of the four major uh, cast members from the cartoon, the Sad AM cartoon, that hadn't made appearances in other games. Uh, there's Bunny, um, <clears throat> Rotor, with a much bigger head and a much smaller body, and even Princess Sally. Uh, although you may notice the colors are a little different, uh, my guess is that <clears throat> this game was in development... Uh, when the when the when the Sad AM cartoon was in development, and um, they had worked off of very early preliminary design sketches, because they did initially go with a Princess Sally's color scheme, where she was a lot more pink and with black hair. I think uh, her her brown and red haired color scheme was a uh, was really a late decision, as even in the pilot, Sally had lighter colors. So they're probably working on some really early concept art. Um, and also, look at the reflection of Sonic in the glass of this pinball machine. That is the Sad AM cartoon Sonic. He has a single row of spines going from his the back of his head down his back like a like an enormous mohawk. Uh, he has a perfectly round head. Um, that that is the Sad AM Sonic. That that is a Sonic the Hedgehog drawn to look like he does in the cartoons. That's not the, car the Sonic the Hedgehog from the video games. And remember, Sonic 2 had been made. Video game Sonic's look had already been established. He had six spines on his head, three rows of two, and two more spines on his back. So this is very much what Sonic looked like in the cartoons, not the older games. So if ever there was a, a case to show that that the Sonic, the, the, the Dr. Robot, the... Uh, <laughs> That Sonic Spinball was ever made to be an adaptation of the Sad AM cartoon, this screenshot is uh, probably the most compelling evidence for that. Speaking of uh, cartoon adaptations, of course there was going to be cross-promotion. 
<clears throat> you got to remember, these cartoons were actually pretty popular in their time, except for the fact that Power Rangers was sapping away all the Saturday morning ratings. But, of course, they would use the cartoon as an opportunity to, to you know, advertise this game. Um, <clears throat> oh, man, I'm really sick. Uh, the Attack on Pinball Fortress episode of the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon, uh, which first had an air date in October of 1993, uh, barely a month before the actual game would be released on a console, was probably the thing that they were hoping would, would make the most sales, because it's a pretty blatant thing. Like, look at that, look at that building. It has freaking pinball flippers on the side of it. Um... And uh, the, we actually get to see the first boss from the game, uh, Scorp. I believe it's called Scorp. Uh, although it looks vastly different here than it did in the game. Um, and so yeah, there we go. That's uh, that's the uh, that that was the uh, Adventures cartoon adaptation of this game. Um, of course, it would be adapted in the comic book as well, but that's no big deal. The comic book always adapts to games, even back then. And it's funny, look at the art style. The art style of the comic from way back then actually looked like this, the, the Adventures cartoon. That's kind of funny. Of course, the really famous adaptation of Sonic CD is going to be the, uh, the Game Guy episode from Sat AM. Now, I was actually quite surprised in my research that I found out that Game Guy's original air date was actually all the way back in September of 1994, like almost a year after the Spinball game came out. I guess we can chalk this up to the fact that with only a weekly airing schedule, the fact that this is a Season 2 episode and therefore had to air after the, uh, it, the intermittent break, and the fact that um, there's a higher quality of animation in this show. I guess it just took more time to produce this episode than the, uh, <clears throat> than the one for the Adventures cartoon. <clears throat> but, okay, this episode. Um, it begins with this Ram guy. Uh, he, it turns out he's the leader of another Freedom Fighter cell, and all of his people have been captured by Dr. Eggman, and, uh, he asked Sonic to help rescue them. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, he leads Sonic into the uh, Pinball Fortress, which, by the way, looks like this in the cartoon. Hey, yeah, that... Yeah, wow, why, why didn't the game look like this? This is awesome! Um, yeah, and uh, and uh, it turns out to be a trap. Uh, it turns out that, that the Ram guy, I believe his name was Ari or something, he betrayed Sonic. Oh, and by the way, the, the first level boss is Scorpius. Not Scorp, Scorpius. Ah, okay, now, once again, people who jump to the comments section before I f finishing watching the video, you have once again been made to look foolish. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so, um, yeah, so, uh, now, at first you think, okay, this is, this is all silly fun, right? So, he's led into this pinball fortress, like, um, the penalty for failing the pinball machine would be to be pulled into the zone of silence, which is where Nogus and King Acorn were sent. Uh, like, but, but aside from that, like, ah, look at him, he's fighting this little, little silly pinball thing. He made a pinball themed death trap, hardy har har. And then that's when we find out that Ari demands that, uh, Robotnik maintain his end of the deal. And that's when we find out that Robotnik had already roboticized all of his friends and all the people from his Freedom Fighter cell. Did you forget that this is Sonic Sad AM? Of course it's incredibly dark and messed up. So, finding out that everyone he knew and loved is essentially dead, because, remember, they never really did find a way to permanently reverse roboticization, um, <laughs> Ari uh, flees and gets Sonic the Hedgehog a power ring, which gives him the power that he needs to escape the pinball fortress. And uh, Ari gets sucked into the zone of silence uh, for his troubles. Um, we wouldn't see the last of this goat guy. He did appear in the episode with uh, where we finally got to see King Max. Uh, they were actually able to get him back at least because he hadn't spent so much time in the zone of silence that it began to sap away his life force. So, yay, good on this Ram guy. He would get to he would be able to appear in the final episode and and appear to get his revenge for all of his people who were roboticized. But yeah, that was the Game Guy adaptation. Uh, probably the most memorable uh, Sonic Spinball adaptation. So memorable that you actually forget it came out a whole year after the game itself. <laughs> I'm sorry for the uh, poor audio quality of that segment. My uh, my voice is straining. Was 
way more amplified in the uh, when the microphone was in my face. I apologize for that. But my point remains clear. Um, now we have the Sonic Boom cartoon on the air, and we know for a full fact that, that the, the Sonic Boom cartoon was made specifically to tie in with the Sonic Boom video game. And since the art assets for both the shows are so similar, like, the video game is basic, the cartoon is basically like the cutscenes from the video game made, um, episodically, you know, that's, <laughs> so, but, you know, this was the 90s, uh, back then, there was no internet to, to, to get instant feedback off of, there was, uh, um, there was, uh, Sonic's Legacy was still relatively new, like, this was only his fourth game overall, uh, and, um, and even though he had cartoon adaptations, there wasn't really that much communication going on between the people who produced the cartoons and the people who produced the, the video games. So making an adaptation of, uh, you know, like, t you take a, a video game character, you adapt into a cartoon, and then they try to take this cartoon and adapt it back into another video game. It was an admirable attempt for the time. I mean, you, you see the, the, the vast differences, so... Um, but, you know, they, they tried. They put... They, there was real, genuine effort to make this into an adaptation and to try and sell this as a, as a multi-platform franchise. Like, like, I wish it had succeeded a little better. I wish that... Um, I wish that this game had been more popular and uh, that it might have inspired the creation of more merchandise, which ultimately would have made Sonic more successful back in the day. Uh, yeah, like, remember when the uh, classic Sonic action figure came out? And uh, I said that I had wanted one of those things ever since 1993 or 1994. And, uh, well, I'm guessing that the, the, re the fact that these cartoons and this game wasn't a little bit more successful in their time probably why we didn't get that toy until until Jazzwares made it for the Generations line in 2000 freaking 11. <laughs> that said, is the game actually good? That is a very subjective measure. I think it's a pretty good game for what it is, but what it is is completely different from Sonic's previously established formula. It's a totally different genre of game. And a lot of people, when they see a character jump from one genre to the other, their knee-jerk reaction is to automatically call that, that, that new game bad because it's not like what they're familiar with. That's not a real measure of a game's quality. The fact is that Sonic Spinball, like I said, the levels can take a long time to get through, um, with no save feature and a very tedious level skip code, uh, it can be kind of a drain to play your way through the whole thing, but I never really felt like the game had a bad design. Like, it works for what it was trying to do. Like, being able to steer Sonic in the air so that you can co so that you don't have to purely rely on the ballistic paths of the flippers was a brilliant idea, because if, if you... If Sonic did just move in straight lines when you launch him for the flipper or go through ballistic arches because of simulated gravity, the game probably would have been nigh unplayable. I mean, some weird physics genius who's able to perfect every Angry Bird stage might have been able to get through it, but, but no ordinary kid would have been able to hit all the targets and stuff. So, I think that what they did was good. The game was perfectly functional. It looked good. And oh yeah, I didn't mention this. The music in this game is awesome. Now, I'm not going to actually play any of the music samples because I might get a copyright strike. You know, one of my videos, one, one of my videos from Philadelphia Comic Con, like a 45-minute video got muted because of a of a 20-second music clip that happened to be playing in the background when one of the when one of the characters came up. I didn't even notice that they played a stupid song because I was focusing on the commentary for the character up on the stage. But they muted my entire video for 20 seconds of a song I don't even know the name of. So yeah, no music in here. But I will say that it's awesome, especially the boss music. 
I really regret that my gen my Model 1 Sega Genesis is no longer compatible with my new TVs. I have got to get an old model TV specifically for the purpose of setting up that Genesis on in a little game room so I can enjoy the original music chip tunes from it. Because my new my new uh, Genesis Flashback console, it, it it's a very nice console, the Genesis Flashback. Like, the games play smoothly, there's no lag, they look fine. Uh, it looks a little bit weird in an HD TV because the graphics look a little fuzzier because they were never really meant for HD, but it's all good. But the music, the, the thing has different sound chips which don't accurately replicate the music that came out of the original Genesis. So... I mean, I can still kind of see it. I can hear the memory of the music that I loved as a kid. But, but no, like, th this music was awesome. This was rocking awesome music. Like, oh, the raspy voice actually helps with the thing. Like, <laughs> you, you gotta listen to it. You gotta find, um, like, 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 go, we're, we're on YouTube. See if you can find if someone has posted this music, because it's awesome. The boss music from Sonic Spinball is awesome. <laughs> That's actually the greatest thing about this game, the music. I, I love the music of this game. Um, I'm very nostalgic for the for the Genesis chip tunes. I know a lot of people say that the uh, the sound architecture for the Genesis was actually quite hampered, and uh, you would get much better sound quality from the SNES. But you know, the people who developed games for the for the Genesis worked with what they had, and they made some really cool stuff. And this is no exception. This is actually some of the coolest boss music I've ever heard. I can almost play this this over any boss from any game ever, and I feel like it would be enhanced. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so Sonic Spinball. It was a pretty interesting game. Uh, I liked it. Uh, it's not my favorite from the Genesis, uh, but, you know, it's still good. It's still a great game. I still feel that it's worth playing. Uh... You can probably easily download this on some kind of virtual console, but, um, you know, it's good. It's good. And, oh, yeah, they also made, uh, Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. Uh, this, uh, this is the closest thing to an Adventure of Sonic the Hedgehog adaptation, actually featuring Scratch, Grounder, Coconuts, the, uh, the, uh, the Adventures version of Robotnik, a plot line that actually would have fit in the cartoon, like, I will kidnap the fun-loving Jolly Beans of Beanville and turn them into my robot servants. And it was actually just an import of a Japanese puzzle game. I believe it was uh, Doki Doki Panic or something like that. Um, I don't don't quote me on that. But the the game was originally made in Japan. Had absolutely nothing to do with Sonic the Hedgehog. They imported it. Put us put a, a an Adventures of Sonic skin on top of it to make it into a Sonic game and tricked me into buying it because admittedly I never would have bought the game if it wasn't a Sonic game. But eh, it's a puzzle game. It's kind of fun to play. Puzzle games aren't really my thing. My mom absolutely loves it though. She's she's a total mean bean maniac. But uh, but yeah, it wasn't originally a Sonic game, uh, so yeah. It was just made one. Alright, so I feel that this vlog has gone on quite long. You're probably tired. I know my throat feels like it's about to give out on me, and uh, every time I talk, I feel like I'm going to just spurt a bunch of mucus out my nose. So uh, let's end this here. Uh, this has been Wake Angel 2001, and uh, my next vlog should be a season retrospective on Sonic Boom. Uh, look forward to that pretty soon.